at the Knight campus, impact is more than just a buzzword. As you can see, it's literally written into our name. And an impact that we fully embrace and enjoy is engaging in our passion, all the people here using bioengineering and bioscience to make a difference in people's lives. Welcome everyone to Science Night Out. I'm Bob Goldberg, Executive Director of the Knight Campus, and I must say, after having this event several years online, I'm thrilled to be back in person with all of you at the Shedd Institute in downtown Eugene. Now, before we get to the highlight of the evening, I want to take a few moments to celebrate the rising national recognition and rapid growth of the Knight Campus in our community. There are lots of ways to measure impact and growth, but one very visible way is the physical expansion of the campus. Hopefully most of you here tonight have had a chance to visit the first Knight Campus building, shown here in my favorite nighttime picture, which to my amazement is close to being at full capacity with over 300 people working and training inside less than three years after we opened the doors in the fall of 2020. And this is just the first phase of a multi-building campus that is already beginning to transform the university in our region with new scientific discoveries, new academic programs never before available to students at the U of O, and new startup companies from our faculty and students. People around the nation are really noticing what's going on here in Eugene. And with one influential thought leader recently saying, and I quote, the Knight Campus is a wonderful and refreshing development in national innovation and university research life. This month, we broke ground on the second Knight Campus building. When it's completed, Building 2 will double our capacity for bioengineering research training and the development of new biomedical technologies. As you can see in this artistic rendering, we are keeping with the design intent of Building 1, but giving the new building its own character. Connected to Building 1 by an enclosed bridge that will span over the mill race, Building 2 will offer additional room for expanding our research programs, our academic programs, and a dedicated space for a new biomedical data science center, which is a joint initiative between the Knight Campus and the Knight Cancer Institute at OHSU. Building 2 will also house the latest scientific equipment for bioprinting tissues and bioanalyzing cells and molecules for developing and testing new clinical therapies. It will also include the second of two Pape Family Innovation Center spaces to house our University of Oregon spin-out companies and other biomedical entrepreneurs. In short, this new building will enable us to fulfill our mission of science advancing society through accelerating the traditionally slow process of taking discoveries from the academic labs out into societal impact. We hope to be moving into this new building by the beginning of December 2025. And like our first building, it will be open to everyone in our community. So please come and see the science on display for yourself. Now, the world-class Knight Campus buildings are critical for enabling science and translation. But perhaps more importantly, they helped us to recruit the best and brightest minds to our community, like our speaker tonight, Professor Benoit. In other words, buildings and new facilities are incredibly necessary, but it's really the people that make the Knight Campus shine. And I am very, very proud of all the hard work and accomplishments of the team of our faculty, staff, and students we've been able to recruit. Now, just to focus on the students for just a moment, I'd like to illustrate how the Knight Campus educational programs are growing by leaps and bounds. We welcomed our first bioengineering PhD cohort in 2020 with eight students. I call them the pioneers. I think a few of them are here tonight. And have quickly grown to become one of the largest graduate programs at the U of O. Our rapidly growing PhD application pools reflect our rising national profile and our evidence of the attractiveness of our hands-on training and educational programs. These talented students could have gone to any of the top programs in the US, but they chose to come here and work in the Knight Campus, and we look forward to welcoming the next new cohort of talented doctoral students this fall. Another way we measure the impact of our educational programs is, of course, how well these programs prepare our graduates to pursue their career choices. The Knight Campus Graduate Internship Program is a nationally recognized applied master's program with five different tracks 
that share a focus on industry-relevant technical and professional skills. Whether you measure it by its training excellence, diversity, graduation rate, or employability post-graduation, this program is absolutely world-class in every way, and it provides its graduates with a direct path to high-paying industry jobs or, if they choose, to continue their graduate studies to earn their PhD. Another educational opportunity that continues to expand is our Knight Campus Undergraduate Scholars Program. Started in 2019, we've offered a competitive one-year opportunity for undergraduates to conduct research in one of our associated laboratories while being exposed to a set of curated professional development workshops. These students are paid stipends to, to support their work, and I'm happy to say this program has been fully funded the past two years by generous alumni, friends, Knight Campus faculty, and companies. Thus far, we have been able to provide fellowships to over 50 undergraduates, and many say that this has been the most pivotal experience that they've had for choosing their career path. Whether it's gonna be an industry, medical school, or a graduate school. Now, some of you who generously support the Knight Campus Undergraduate Scholars Program are in the audience tonight, and so on behalf of these students, I say thank you for making such a profound difference in their individual careers and for helping us collectively to build a stronger pipeline of well-trained and diverse next generation scientists, doctors, and engineers. And finally, before I introduce our speaker tonight, I just want to highlight a few students and faculty who have received highly prestigious awards or recognitions this past year. These include Ethan Din, who is an undergraduate student researcher in my lab, who received one of just 400 Goldwater scholarships awarded nationally from a pool of over 5,000 applicants. At the PhD level, Kaylee Myers has been awarded a highly competitive fellowship from the National Science Foundation that basically provides her a full ride for her studies over the next three years. And our faculty have also been highly recognized, including Dr. Marion Hiderachi, who in addition to becoming a new mom in December, was recently awarded a prestigious NSF Career Award. Dr. Kalen Plesha, a recipient of the highly coveted NIH New Innovator Award. And finally, Dr. Keet Gi Ong, who has received multiple federal business innovation awards for his startup company in Eugene, Pandaria Technologies. Let's congratulate these incredibly talented students and faculty. All right, now on to the main event. One of the most significant transformative milestones that Phil and Penny Knight's generosity has enabled is the creation of the University of Oregon's very first engineering program in its history, the Knight Campus Department of Bioengineering. And I'm delighted that after a highly competitive national search, we were able to recruit Dr. Danielle Benoit from the University of Rochester to be the inaugural Lori Loke Chair of the Department of Bioengineering. An award-winning teacher and mentor for, to next generation researchers, as well as an NIH and NSF funded researcher, Benoit specializes in the rational design of polymeric biomaterials for regenerative medicine and drug delivery applications. Joining us in the fall of 2022, we are already feeling the positive impact of Dr. Benoit's leadership as she plays an instrumental role in shaping and maturing our research and education portfolio and developing a strategic plan for the new department over the next decade. Dr. Benoit's talk, Precision Medicine for Better Bones, will highlight her research at the interface of medicine and engineering. A leader in the development of new drug delivery systems, she's provided insights into the translation of tissue engineering strategies for bone healing and the development of tissue models for new drugs. She seeks to understand how biomaterials can control the behavior of cells in order to improve the treatment of a variety of diseases and injuries. All right, it's time for me to get off this stage because I know you came here tonight to hear about Danielle's research and her career journey, but I'll be back for the Q&A session. At this moment, please join me in welcoming the 2023 Science Night Out speaker and our new department chair, Professor Danielle Benoit. Thanks. 
Thank you so much for being here. It's an honor that you're here to share this evening with me. So um, as the title suggests, I'm here to talk to you about bone. So I wake up in the morning and I think about bones. It's a beautiful tissue. Part of that is because I'm swinging my legs over the side of the bed and standing up and hoping that I don't crumple into a ball. <laughs> um, but, um, but I dream about making, um, making new therapeutics that enhance bone healing. And bone is really a beautiful tissue. Um, it's hierarchical in nature. It's, it's really instrumental to our everyday lives. So bone plays a really critical role, as I already alluded to, to your structure of your body. Um, it's really important in locomotion. Um, it plays a role together with some other tissues within your body to enable that, that movement. It's also really important for organ protection. So for example, your ribs protect your, your lungs and your heart, but your hips also are protecting some important organs, and then of course your cranium. It's also really important for mineral storage. Um, so it stores calcium and phosphate and other, other minerals and allows them to be in a depot type of situation where when your body needs those, those minerals, it can get them from your, from your skeleton. And, and bone is really wondrous. It's constantly being remodeled. So as we're sitting here today, you have bones that are working away at remodeling your bone tissue. It's really incredible. And it does that because as you're walking, you know, due to the structural capacity of your skeleton, as you're walking around playing sports or jogging or, you know, skiing or what have you, micro cracks will actually form within your bone and it will signal to cells within your bone that this bone tissue is starting to degrade. And so those cells will be recruited and start to remodel your bone tissue. And what's really neat is over a decade, your bone completely remodels. So every, every centimeter cubed of your bone tissue is remodeled over a decade. It's really incredible. And again, as we're sitting here, that's what's happening. It's really, really cool. So it's a, it's a living tissue. And so it's a beautiful thing that that's happening because um, if I can get some audience participation now, how many of you have ever broken a bone? All right, a, a good number. I would say the majority for sure. How many of you had challenges in healing? So you went to check up with your doctor and things weren't going very well. It's okay, you can, you can, you can announce yourselves. Um, <laughs> So that's pretty common, actually. So we think of bone as being highly regenerative, but in fact, about 10% of fractures don't heal properly, okay? And that's something that I'm really interested in. So I wanna um, take a moment um, and introduce you to my daughter. So Katie, this is Katie, so Catherine Amelia Benoit. So she is seven. Um, and she's a very active seven-year-old, as most seven-year-olds are. What you see here is she's got a beautiful purple cast. So about 72 hours before we were slated to jump on an airplane and move from Rochester, New York to Eugene, Oregon, I went to pick her up from gymnastics camp. Yeah, you all see where this is going. Um, and, and she's got her arm like this as she walks out and, and she comes out with somebody, which that rarely happens unless they're in trouble, unless the kids are in trouble, you know, you've been there. And sure enough, she had been bounced off the trampoline by a friend of hers and, you know, was in clearly insignificant pain, um, cause her pain threshold is pretty high. So I, I knew that, you know, <laughs> with three days left in Rochester and a whole slew of things that were still left on the to-do list that we were headed to urgent care. So sure enough, we went to urgent care and, um, and what happened was, you know, she got an x-ray. She was diagnosed with what is known as an avulsion fracture. So you can see this piece of bone that's hanging out in the soft tissue outside of her left elbow. Not a huge problem, like this, this will heal, she's young, healthy, not a big deal, but kind of a problem because if this bone got stuck within her joint, 
that would, could cause some pretty big disaster um, in terms of the soft tissue within the joint space. So, um, so of course, you know, like we did our best, got her the medical care that she needed, and, and then had a follow-up once we got to Eugene, so went to Slocum. Five weeks later, you wouldn't know that anything had ever happened. And this is very consistent with young, healthy bones, like very fortunately the one that my daughters have, our daughter has. <laughs> Um, so it healed, you know, virtually without any distinctive marks, um, so scarlessly. That doesn't always happen, though, and that's really where we're, we're interested in trying to innovate. So um, if you have a massive injury due to trauma you, and you lose a lot of your bone tissue, um, that won't heal properly. If you have underlying conditions that causes thinning of bone or osteoporosis, and often age is one of the major, major issues with osteoporosis, um, that's also a problem. And then if you have bone cancer, and, and due to the um, resection of that cancer, you can also lose a lot of bone tissue. These won't heal on their own. And so what, what I'm trying to do in my work is, is address these. And if we just take osteoporosis, about 10 million Americans are living with osteoporosis. 1.5 million of those will, will have a fragility-related fracture due to osteoporosis. This is annually, so every year. And it costs us, it costs society $20 billion a year. So this is very common, costly, and debilitating. The risk of those fractures are really dire for patients. So you have a 20% chance of dying within a year if you have a fragility fracture. 30% chance of permanent disability, 40% chance of inability to walk again, and 80% chance of losing some you know, independence in your life. And that can be any number of things. And mo most starkly, 50% of these fractures can be avoided with cost-effective and well-tolerated treatments. And so, um, Hopefully, I'll, I'll convince you that we're on the hunt for one of those um, within my group. So what we're trying to do is understand how Katie has this amazing ability to regenerate her bone tissue and adapt it in the context of some of these more dire conditions. So I need to, to take a moment and teach you a little bit about how bone is remodeled, okay? So we, I already told you a little bit about how it's being remodeled right now. Well, there are cell types within your bone that are responsible for this process. One of those is called the osteoclast. Um, so it's this, this um, cell right here. Um, and here's your bone tissue. And I'm just showing a very generic bone tissue. There could be a fracture here. There could be an injury here. Or it could just be your friendly osteoclast just resorbing your bone tissue as, as you're at science night out. So, um, so your osteoclast um, is recruited into your bone and it starts to resorb your bone tissue. So if, if you want a, a little um, mnemonic, osteoclast cleans up your bone. So you can use that to kind of remember because there's a few different cell types we'll talk about today. So the osteoclasts come in, they start to resorb your bone. Um, what's really cool is that they excavate this little cavity and they leave molecular signals, like little zip codes within the bone. Um, one of those molecules is known as tartate resistant acid phosphatase. They're, they also um, leave breadcrumbs to bring in cells that start to remake your bone, okay? Um, so they, they release these molecules, these factors, and that signals to the osteoblasts, these are the builders of your bone, so these are the, the, one, the cells that are going to make the new bone. And those osteoblasts will come in and then build up the bone tissue that's been, been resorbed by the osteoclast. Again, this is to you know, heal fractures, it's to ensure your bone has the structural stability that it needs with the microcracks that might be forming. So, so this happens all the time. Um, and there's the osteoblast building the bone. And under the normal situations, including Katie's and hopefully many of ours, there's this beautiful balance between the osteoclast and the osteoblast in terms of their resorption of bone and production of bone. So you have very normal um, bone tissue, healthy architecture, and good stability, and your bone functions normally. However, 
in the context of osteoporosis, there's an imbalance where resorption outpaces production and therefore you get this thinning process and thinning of your bone tissue, which is ultimately a problem in terms of fragility fractures. So, um, so we're interested in trying to rebalance that, right? So rebalance that teeter-totter back to having the same resorption and production. So one way we can do this is to deliver drugs exactly at that space where bone is being remodeled. And we're interested in developing any number of, of drugs and getting, getting them to the, the bone resorptive surface, small molecules, proteins, peptides, et cetera. Again, to rebalance this teeter-totter and rescue bone production from your osteoblasts. However, we have a major challenge in drug delivery. So with traditional drugs that you might inject or ingest or otherwise, you can inject them, ingest them, whatever, um, but they clear very rapidly. Um, so they circulate in the body for a very short amount of time, from, amount, from minutes to maybe up to 24 hours, which doesn't allow for a lot of that drug to then have an effect on your bone. The other challenge is that drugs really don't go to bone. So it's, it's not very vascularized, it's not you know, very easy for drugs to get to that tissue. So only 1% of the injected drug gets to your bone tissue in this case. So you suffer in both ways where there's poor circulation time, poor ability to circulate and get to the bone and then very poor biodistribution. And so furthermore, that can lead to off-target toxicity. So where you're trying to increase the amount of drug that gets to bone, you can increase the dose, but then you might bleed into the toxicity range. And, and we know about toxicity from the standpoint of chemotherapeutic drugs, right? So you're trying to kill the cancer, but not the patient, and it's a very fine line. So there has to be a better way, and that's, that's kind of what we're trying to address. And so sorry for those who might be triggered by chemical <laughs> structures. I was, I was meaning to prime you on this. It's like some of the grotesque structures. But um, so we use materials. So we use biomaterials in my lab to try to address this and develop drug delivery systems based on these biomaterials. I'll take a little bit of the chemistry away in a sec. Um, to make it a little more simplified. So we start with polymers. So these are repeating structures of, of chemical entities. Um, and they're shown here. Um, I'm not gonna go into grave depth, but what I'll tell you is that um, we make um, two different flavors of chains of polymers. And you can kind of think about these as threads or pieces of spaghetti where the first part in purple is hydrophilic. So that means it's water liking. So these chains have a water liking element where our bodies are 90% water. So that will be very happy to be in your body. The second part is hydrophobic. So very greasy um, and, and wants, doesn't wanna be at all in your body, okay? But you can kind of think of this of as um, part thread, like cotton-based thread, that's going to be happy in water, and then part fishing line that's going to be very unhappy in water. And so when these two different entities that are stuck together are introduced into a water-based solvent, your body, they will self-assemble into structures, many different types of structures, but the structures that we self-assemble into are called nanoparticles, where again, these water-loving elements of these blocks um, are in the exterior, and then you have these hydrophobic or, or water-hating parts in the interior where they like one another, but they don't like water, okay? So these nanoparticles are on the order of about 25 nanometers. What the heck is that? <laughs> So it's 25 times 10 to the negative ninth meters. Again, what the heck is that? So if you take a human hair, you can line up 4,000 of these nanoparticles head to head, and that's the thickness of a human hair. So these are really small. So how in the world do we know that we even have these things, right? Well, I'll tell you, we have some pretty neat ways to look at them. 
So um, we can use really high-powered uh, microscopy to do so. Um, and this is electron microscopy. And what you see here is that you, know, these ha you have these electron-dense regions um, and these hairy, sphere-like things that are indeed the nanoparticles. So, um, so unless I'm a really creative artist, um, hopefully that's somewhat convincing. Here I have a vial of the nanoparticles. I actually have them tonight with me too. So, so these are the nano, this is that exact vial. I took a picture of it, took off the label, but I put the label back on. It's important in science to have labels. <laughs> um, so, you know, like this is what they look like. It just kind of looks like I poured a little bit of milk into, into some water, but I, but I promise, you know, the imaging, it's, it's the same. So another really low-tech way that we like to look at our nanoparticles, and actually low, semi-high-tech, depending upon the instrumentation behind it, um, is to just shine a laser beam through the nanoparticles, okay? And because of their size, um, when you're just shining a laser beam at a wall, this is my office at Night Campus, um, you know, you have just just the laser beam, right? So, and this would be true through water or you know, any solution. Um, when you have nanoparticles in the way, you get this scattering of the light into this, this linear beam. And so, I, I tried this earlier and it kind of worked. So, so you, can, you can try this, I'm happy to let you try it later. So we have these little nano packages, right? And what's great is that they're, they've got this, um, hydrophobic interior that we can load a variety of drugs into. And actually, we, we haven't just loaded drugs into the interior. We've done a little bit loading in the interface of the hydrophobic and the hydrophilic region. Um, so these are really great for drug delivery. So they allow us to um, achieve or overcome some of the challenges of small molecule drug delivery. So we can reduce drug clearance. So by, by embedding drugs into these nanoparticles, we get greater circulation time throughout the body. Um, we can also introduce targeting ligands using chemistry to get these nanoparticles to bone. And that's something that we've really innovated, innovated on in my group. So there's a variety of options to decorate these nanoparticles to get them to specific tissue sites. So for example, um, there's work in the field that has introduced small molecules like the vitamin folic acid to target the folic acid receptor, which is commonly overexpressed in tumors. Um, you might wanna use an, an antibody um, that's just a big protein that is specific to other proteins um, to target different sites within the body. But we've leveraged peptides in my group um, and peptides that have selectivity to bone. So I introduced um, this protein that is deposited by osteoclasts in the context of bone remodeling, tartate resistant acid phosphatase or TRAP. So it's this molecule that we've actually been able to identify peptides with, with, with targeting capacity to this particular protein. And we've done so, so if we look at this, this bone instead of on the side, if we look at it on face, and this is actually an electron micrograph of one of these excavation pits where these osteoclasts have resorbed or cleaned up your bone. What you see here is that, and I've drawn in the tartate resistant, and this is not what it looks like. <laughs> so, so if, you, if you use other methodologies, you can see that the tartate-resistant acid phosphatase is there. Um, and what we've done is used a small organism known as a bacteriophage, um, so sorry for the big word. What's neat about this is it, it itself actually is a nanoparticle, but it's living-ish. Um, <laughs> and, and it can express peptides many different kinds of peptides, a whole repertoire of peptides, and you can have many of these phages in a solution that are expressing a variety of peptides. So many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of peptides. And so we've screened these phage for their ability to bind to the resorptive pits, 
And what we found is, is a, a peptide, and actually we weren't sure that it bound to trap. It took a little more searching out to identify what it was actually homing to. Um, but what we found is that it bound, there was a peptide that was expressed that bound to trap, and we called it trap-binding peptide. Creative, huh? <laughs> um, it's stuck, so we're going with it. And it has a really good affinity. So this is sub-nanomolar affinity. It's a really high affinity. And, and yeah, take my word for it. That's a really good number. Um, <laughs> so, so we wanted to leverage this. And so what we did is we introduced this peptide into the nanoparticles to uh, promote targeting. Um, and so one of the first things that we needed to do, though, is test, does this really work? So here's the model. You have our, our targeted nanoparticles. And do they really go to trap? Um, and then after they get to, to trap, are they able to you know, release whatever drug that might be of interest to enhance bone remodeling? And then you know, promote and, and reestablish this balance between osteoclast and osteoblast. So the first question was, does the targeting work? Because if it doesn't work, then we're going to start over, go back to some other experiments. So, um, so we tested this in a fracture. And um, you know, we did controls. We int introduced just saline. Um, but when we introduced nanoparticles, we saw some really nice fracture accumulation of those nanoparticles. The nanoparticles are labeled so we can see them in the body. Um, scrambled peptide nanoparticles also accumulate, and, and this is a known property of, of nanoparticles that, that they'll extravasate or get out into the fracture site when there's an injury. Um, also other injuries, but, but what was really cool is that we could see a much greater intensity up into the red range of our nanoparticles when we introduce our targeting peptide, our, our trap binding peptide. And, and you could see it also be prolonged. The signal is prolonged at the fracture site. We can quantitate this. So hopefully to, to prove to, to those, you know, picture science is, is you know, we'll, we'll, we quantitate things. Um, so we can look at fracture accumulation over time. And you see saline here in red, not, nothing too exciting, um, as would be expected. Um, and then the nanoparticles and scrambled um, peptide nanoparticles, you do see some accumulation, but with the targeting ligand that we identified, we get about a two-fold increase in signal um, that lasts um, the longest, um, so over about 350 hours. So we get good targeting. We can look across different tissues, too, and there's a lot of data here, um, but, but we did look at all of these different tissues. What's really cool, and I'll highlight this for you, is when we look at fractured bone, um, and here is the fracture site right here. So the, the fracture, the bone is actually sitting horizontally, and then the fracture is right here in the middle. Um, and here's nanoparticle, and there's you know, some pink, so the pink is the nanoparticle here. Um, there's some scrambled nanoparticles that you can kind of see, but it's when you look at the targeted nanoparticles where you see this blazing pink that's consistent with the fracture site, exactly at the fracture site. So it does seem like we get greater targeting, greater accumulation directly at the fracture site. So that's pretty exciting. So we can quantitate this. I wanna point out two things, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave all the data here for a second while I point out the first. What's really neat is that when you go to nanoparticles, to scramble, to, to the targeted, you see a reduction in off-target organ accumulation. So things like the liver go down, the spleen goes down as we target, lung, kidney. And what's also great um, is that when we look at the fractured bone, we get an enormous increase. So those nanoparticles, instead of going all over the body, are much more selectively getting to the fracture site. So that's really cool. So this kind of works, kind of amazing. Don't tell my students I said that. <laughs> so the targeting works. So now can we enhance healing? So I won't go into too many details about the choice of drug, but I'm happy to answer them if you have any questions. Um, so we used a drug that was known to be regenerative. I'm going to be really general, um, but it 
it does act through the Wnt beta catenin signaling pathway and blocks glycogen synthase kinase 3 beta. That's a lot of words. This is the molecule. It's beautiful because it's super hydrophobic, just like the core of our nanoparticles. So we can load a lot into these nanoparticles and, and we think at least getting, get them to, to the fracture site. So when we look at healing, so this is some pictures. So I'm gonna explain what, what we're looking at. Again, we're looking at the horizontal of that femur and looking exactly at the fracture right here. Um, and we have our control of saline where we don't expect to see much. And, and, and I should back up and say, these fractures will heal. Um, so we're looking at a window where we can enhance healing in the, in the context of these images. Um, and what, we look, what we're looking for is cartilage in blue. So this is kind of like pre-bone tissue. And then the pink and, is bone and soft tissue. Um, so not much, you know, not much exciting to look at, but a good control of saline and then free drug. And then here's the scrambled peptide drug, uh, nanoparticle drug. It's really when we get to the targeting group and only when we get to week four that things get interesting, okay? Let me explain this to you. So the cartilage is what gets deposited first in the, the remodeling cycle of, of, um, of fracture healing. So there's this, this cartilage that's collagen rich, um, and we see it here in, in every group, but it's transitioned fully at week four with our targeted drug delivery system to bone, meaning that it's healing a lot faster right, when we have that targeting group to deliver the regenerative therapeutic. So that's pretty exciting. We can look at also at mineralized tissue. So this is an imaging technique known as microcomputed tomography. So here we're looking at bone, mineralized tissue, bone. This, so I try not to confuse anybody, but, but in this way, um, we're looking actually at the bone in a vertical way. Um, so instead of the horizontal, which we've looked at so far, now it's in a vertical fashion where um, the, the top of the bone or the hip bone is up here, and then the knee bone is down here in this femur. And then the fracture site is right here kind of in the middle. And what you see from these mineralized tissue images is um, some pretty interesting findings. So here again at week two, we see greater mineralization, at least it, by eye. Um, we can also see that across um, week four where the targeted nanoparticle drug also seems to have an improvement in that mineralized tissue deposition. We quantify this too, um, so it makes it a little bit easier. Um, so we're not just doing this by eye. Um, and we do see a, a pretty significant improvement in mineralized tissue formation. Here we're looking at, at a volume, so millimeters cubed of that mineralized tissue. And, and we do see a pretty significant improvement over our controls of saline free drug and the scrambled peptide nanoparticle drug at both two and at four weeks. So um, that does corroborate what our eyes were telling us, right? So a final measure of healing um, is, is structural, right? So that's kind of the main purpose, well, one of the main purposes of the skeleton is structural rigidity, right? So we also measure that, um, and, I, and I don't have any pretty pictures to represent that, I just have, I just have data. Um, but what you can see here is when we measure torsional rigidity, um, which is just one of those biomechanical measures, um, what we find is that with the targeted nanoparticle drug, we see a very significant improvement in that mechanical um, stability. And what's also really great is that already at four weeks after injury and treatment, we're at the same level of uninjured bones. So this clearly has a significant enhancement in bone uh, regeneration in terms of the targeting. So to summarize, at least now, um, this isn't the end of the story. It gets more interesting. There's a little twist. So we have our targeted nanoparticles that get to the, that target this tartate-resistant acid phosphatase. Um, when they get to bone, at least we think, um, they're releasing drug, and it's affecting the osteoblast and getting them to produce new bone. Well, that's what we thought, but then we did this study. 
So in this study, um, we collected the cells that were at the fracture callus. So these, these ones that were positive for the nanoparticles. So we're receiving the signals to enhance regeneration, right? And it's not those builders, like I said that it was, it wasn't the osteoblasts that, that are taking up these nanoparticles. It's another cell type that I haven't told you about yet, but I'm about to, known as a macrophage. So it's macrophages that, that take up the majority of those nanoparticles at the fracture site. So let me tell you a little bit about those macrophages. So I, I told you a really simple story about how bone is resorbed and then regenerated. I told you about two cell types. But any time the bone is injured, or even when you have microcracks, it's not as simple as these two cell types. It's not just the osteoblast and osteoclast. There's actually a lot of inflammation, and associated with that inflammation is a large majority of the macrophage. So these cells that were positive for nanoparticles when we looked for where the nanoparticles were going at the fracture. So when I'm scaling for numbers, this is pretty accurate. So there's a lot of macrophage that are participating in the early stages of bone remodeling, okay? So it's no wonder that these are the cell types that are there and taking up the nanoparticle. But that's really cool because it still works, right? So the, the therapy is still effective. So how is this working? So we had to find out. So it seems like as resorption is occurring, you know, yes, the osteoblasts are coming in. We're not, hopefully not monkeying with that system. Um, but what's happening is that our macrophage, we think, are transitioning to a more regenerative macrophage based on our drug delivery, which is then signaling to the osteoblast to make more bone, right? So it's just an intermediary um, to signal to enhance this bone remodeling process. So we tested this. So when we took the cells, um, so not the exact same tissue, but I'm using the same diagram. Um, so when we took the cells and asked, okay, for these nanoparticle positive cells and macrophages in particular, what do they, what do they behave like? Are they truly these regenerative cells? And, and this is um, a, a lot of gene expression that's just kind of compiled into, into a, what is known as a heat map. But what you see in the, is in this heat map, when we have these targeted nanoparticles, we get a huge amount of expression here, these light teal colors of regenerative genes. And a down regulation, so reduced expression of inflammatory genes, which can be the other side of the coin in terms of a macrophage. So indeed, the macrophage that are targeted are receiving these signals transitioning into a more regenerative phenotype, at least based on this data. So again, back to our model. So, and, and now we have to make it a little more complicated now that we know more. Um, and so these nanoparticles that are targeted, they get to the fracture site and, and bind to tartate-resistant acid phosphatase. Uh, again, they're releasing drugs and altering the phenotype of these macrophages to a more regenerative phenotype which is then causing the osteoblast to then produce more bone. So that's pretty cool. And it also gives us a lot of insight into what other um, drugs we might want to use to enhance this process. So now that we have much greater insight into who's driving this situation, the macrophage in this case, um, we, we can now develop much more effective treatments. So, um, so what I've shown you um, is that um, in the context of this imbalance of resorption and production, um, we might be able to rebalance that in the context of these drug delivery systems to create a situation where we can all heal like Katie, <laughs> um, where there's virtually no uh, hint that she ever had a fracture in the first place. So fractures are one thing though um, and, and this makes, uh, frankly, it's an easy way to test some of our targeted drug delivery systems. But there's so many more op opportunities to impact human health in the context of skeletal health. 
and skeletal injuries. So we firmly believe that um, these targeted drug delivery systems, and now that we know a lot about them and how to manipulate them and what cell types to drug, we can start to treat massive injuries or develop those therapeutics to treat the, and prevent the 50% of fractures that occur due to osteoporotic bone, or to treat um, cancers that have been you know, removed from the bone tissue. Um, so, so that's really compelling and exciting, and that's the frontier that we're headed towards now. What's also really cool is that we think we can treat other things too. So here's Katie, she had her fracture, of course, but we all know that this is not the end of the line for her. <laughs> so she's my daughter, she's, there will be other injuries. So I imagine in a matter of years, this will be her splayed out on the soccer field, much like her mother, or maybe the rugby pitch. <laughs> um, and, and so there's other injuries, right? So I think that there's a real opportunity here because we have some really neat data. So let me tell you about one little snippet of data and then, and then I'll op open up the, the floor for questions. Um, so, so in this soft tissue, so I talked about a few other soft tissues that you know, we, we think we might be able to treat. One of those is tendons. Tendons are particularly challenging. We really don't have any therapies for tendon. But what's really neat is that very recently we discovered, um, despite my, you know, perhaps I sold you on trap being so specific to bone, it's not. <laughs> so we just found out that trap it actually gets upregulated in tendon upon injury. So let me explain this to you. So this is a tendon, and it's been transected right here and then sutured back together. And this is just a, a couple days after injury. And we can go in and we can actually look using um, um, some fancy techniques um, to look at what's being expressed and where it's being expressed within this injury site. And it's blazing red in terms of expression of trap right at that injury um, area. And so the, this, uh, opens up incredible opportunities to develop the first regenerative therapy for tendon. Um, and, you know, we're very early in the, in, you know, the, the development stage of this therapeutic, but it's, it's really very exciting um, that, um, that we can leverage the technology perhaps for other musculoskeletal injuries. Again, like Katie will undoubtedly withstand in her future years. Um, so um, I want to thank you all. This has been a real pleasure. I'm, I hope that it's been worth your while. It's been really an, an honor to, to talk to you tonight. I have to thank the people that actually do the work, right? Um, and the wonderful colleagues and collaborators that, that really are the, the creative artists um, alongside me. Um, so I have my collaborators listed here. Um, this is my research group in Rochester before moving, um, and you know they're still intact. They're still chugging along, and then my new research group that's growing, um, and and actually um, there's another postdoc who just came yesterday and is here tonight, so I missed him here. Um, also, our funding. I'd like to really highlight some past lab members. So this is Marion Akun Farmer, Maureen Newman, and Yu Chen Wang, and the the bulk of this work together with uh, Dorothy Zhao um, is what I got to talk to you about today, as well as Ella Soa Ajai, um, who's right here, and she's doing some of the tendon work. And it's without these really amazing students, so such dedicated and talented students that I have um, within my research group and continue to recruit here at the University of Oregon and Knight Campus, um, that the work is really worthwhile. Um, it's very satisfying. It's so amazing to watch them grow as we make these discoveries and, and start to translate these innovations. Um, so thank you all again for your kind attention and got a few laughs out of the crowds. So that's always good. Um, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Daniel, that was amazing. I think.
Katie's lucky to have a regenerative mom <laughs> be there for all of her injuries. So we can take some questions now. Um, and I think the number, there we go. You can text your questions to the number and uh, I will get them here and I, I can read off some of the questions. So let me, let me just start with one though. Um, and we have to do this because basically we can't see them, right? I mean, it's, the, the lights are blinding here. One question is about nanoparticles. You know, I think people probably have the sense of nanoparticles and maybe they're dangerous or whatever. So could you just talk about, I mean, what would it take to get what you're doing here into people? Sure, yeah, uh, a lot of money. No. <laughs> not, not, not joking. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's, it, you know, I think it, there's so much great data that, you know, that is an inevitability. Um, so the nanoparticles that we make, um, you know, they're, they're polymer in nature and they're self-assembling, which is, is actually a great thing in terms of, you know, potential residence time within the body. Um, and so they'll disassemble and get excreted after they do their business. And in fact, you know, we've looked very carefully for nanoparticles in the context of, you know, when, you know, we're looking at healing metrics and we can go in using electron microscopy to look for nanoparticles that might continue to be there. And they're just not there. I mean, at the initial stages, yes, we can see them. But um, we think in a very short order after they deliver their payload, they degrade into their polymer pieces and then get excreted. Um, so, so I think that, that these have real potential and, and very minimal chance of, of you know, being toxic or dangerous at all. Actually, the, uh, one of the questions that came in is what happens to the nanoparticles? So you oh. just answered that, excellent. Great. Um, but the follow-up was, you know, is it possible that your approach could produce too much bone? It could activate the osteoblast too much? Yeah, no doubt. Um, so this is, you know, definitely a risk. Um, and that's why we need to do a lot of studies to ensure that it's well controlled. I think that there's really great opportunities to have biomarkers to um, be able to assess alongside the therapy to understand, okay, is, is, it, is it too much of the good stuff or, or do we need to turn it down? Do we need to redose? Because this is a particularly challenging fracture injury. So, so I think that you know, our technology has, has great promise and I think that you know, alongside some other technologies that, you know, we have been, you know, in my group also developing some imaging modalities to look at bone healing to predict healing. And so I think that that could be a really wonderful one-two punch in terms of making sure that we don't produce too much bone. Because it's a balance. It's a balance. Just like I showed that teeter-totter. Yep. All right, here's a good question. If the nanoparticles are hydrophilic on the outside, how do they get to the bone? Why don't, you know, if they're in the vascular system oh, where yeah. they're, they're, where they're yeah. happy. Real, they, yeah, real, really good question. So, um, so the, the nanoparticles are in, in the, our blood vessels. So, so we inject them a few different ways, but they get into the systemic circulation. So they're circ circulating around in the body and blood vessels. Um, when you have an injury, and it's not specific to bone, um, the, the vessels will actually become inflamed and um, open up. So they'll have openings that allow for nanoparticles to come out of the bloodstream and then attach to trap. At least that's our model. <laughs> um, you know, we can't look very careful, you know, like we, we don't have a microscope that enables us to follow that over time. But at least we can infer from our data that that's in fact how, how um, they reach the bone tissue. So I, actually this leads really well into the next question, which you talked about osteoporosis, mm -hmm. which seems like this could be really exciting mm -hmm. for osteoporosis. Uh, do you think the strategy will work the same or do you think there'll be some different targeting yeah. challenges? Yeah, so up? we know, um, and actually way back so many years, this project was, was initially motivated by osteoporosis. Um, because TRAP is also overexpressed. So, so in the context of osteoporosis, you have this imbalance, right? And so and you ha you'll have more TRAP deposition. And so that still could be a ligand to target. And I think that, that you know, similar targeting mechanism. I think the drugs could be different. I think that, 
the timing could be different. I think the, the number of doses could be different. So, but, but I think we can leverage the, the core technology um, and with the appropriate testing and development, certainly make good on that promise. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, the next question, this is an interesting one. The data you showed, the images, were those from mice, human, or organoids? Somebody asked it. Oh, wow. <laughs> good, good for you. <laughs> uh, so this is in mice. Um, so, so the data that I showed is all in mice. Um, and, and, you know, and I think that, you know, that begs the question, is it going to be the same in humans? And hopefully someday we, we get to show that data too. Okay, this is an interesting one. Um, I hear about regenerative medicine on the radio. Is that legit? And is that what you're working on or is it somehow different? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would categorize this as regenerative medicine. So absolutely. Um, I mean, I think that there's different flavors of regeneration and, and ours, the one that I talked about today anyway, is a drug delivery approach for that. But absolutely, that's gonna be under that same umbrella. Um, so this one's asking, what are the impediments to going to market? And like, how long does it take, sure. you know? Yeah. Right. Um, so, I mean, with the right investment, <laughs> um, you know, I think that um, we're definitely headed down a path where, you know, we need to do further development in probably another animal model. So we've done work in mice and then the next next animal model um, is critical to then go to get um, pre-market approval. So, you know, the path through the FDA. Um, I mean, that no doubt would is going to take a decade, maybe two, um, just because it's you know, the delivery system is not just a drug. Um, it's a drug and a delivery system. And it's this unique combination that is the entity that would, you know, be approved and finally available for clinical use. And that, you know, just makes for some interesting and, and prolonged development through clinical trials, but, um, but definitely well worth it. And we hope we get there. And you'd need a whole lot more for a human, I presume, than a mouse, uh, right? Course, so yeah. manufacturing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. manufacturing, scale, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, um, you know, perhaps I should have mentioned it prior to now, but I mean, the mRNA vaccines are a nanoparticle and and a lot more challenging to make in in terms of the the entity that makes those nanoparticles. So the polymers actually have an advantage, a unique advantage versus those lipid systems. And so I think that that makes it the path a little even more easy in terms of manufacturing. Okay. Um, this may relate to your fundraising strategy. Someone wants to know about Alex's lemonade stand. Is sure. For raising money for research. <laughs> really happy to tell you about Alex's lemonade stand foundation. And in fact, they they funded some of the early part of this work. Um, so it was my first grant as an independent investigator. Um, so I had started my lab in January and I had applied for this sometime in the fall prior to starting. Um, and, um, and it, you know, it's a wonderful foundation. So they have small starter grants for, for young faculty. I think they have much larger grants now, um, but they were still a pretty young foundation. So it's named after Alex. Um, so Alex had uh, a neuroblastoma, was a young, young patient um, with neuroblastoma um, and lived in Pennsylvania. And so she went through, you know, chemotherapy treatments and, and saw the amazing work that the doctors were doing while she was a patient. And when she recovered and, you know, was back out and living with her family, she said, I want to hold a lemonade stand and, and raise money to fund research to improve the therapies that are being used to treat young patients. And so, you know, for the remainder of her, of her life, which was unfortunately very short, she continued to have these lemonade stands and raised, you know, some like $100,000. And, and her, her parents and then, and then community members were just so, um, you know, so engendered to this idea that they started this foundation which now raises money and, and my lab actually every summer we have a lemonade stand um, to raise money for the foundation. Um, we don't just sell lemonade, we actually make balloon animals too. <laughs> That's a big hit. So look for us at the Eugene Farmers Market this summer. 
Um, and, and, you know, so, you know, our part is very small in terms of, you know, getting the word out and, you know, making sure that we're paying. And we don't have to pay back the money that they gave us, of course, but it's a really great opportunity to raise awareness and, and awareness of our own research as well as, as others. And, and, and it's a really fun, so. That's awesome. Um, what about bone health? You know, short of taking nanoparticles, are there things that we can do in our daily lives to... Ooh, I'll, I'll walk away from you. <laughs> um, absolutely. So I think that, um, you know, staying fit, exercising, any, any strength training, you know, is really important. Our diet, of course, um, you know, making sure it's a healthy diet, eat your greens. Um, so, you know, things like that, I think, are, are really important. Um, and, and, you know, doing your best to, to do a variety of activities. So, so don't just lift weights, but also do yoga and, and, and things like that. I think that that's really important to maintain bone health. Cool. I want to dig a little bit into sort of a science question, because I'm interested. You talked about inflammation, mm. right? And I think inflammation was kind of the bad actor here, right? The macrophage, the good macrophages were on the other end. I think it was okay. It was okay? So <laughs> yeah. is infl I guess the question is, is inflammation always bad? No, uh, inflammation is critical. So, I mean, so the inflammation that I'm talking about is, you know, that natural process. So you have this influx of inflammatory cells just naturally based on some injury, right? Or micro cracks even. Um, and it's really, so, so the beauty for us, I mean, this is not at all what we expected, as I, as I was saying, but we can leverage those cells and actually induce a, a regenerative response. And inflammation absolutely is necessary. Chronic inflammation is where things can, can go awry. Um, so. Okay. Uh, we just have maybe time for one more question, and I wanted to broaden it out a little bit. Um, you talked a little bit at the end about expanding into tendon. I know you also work on some other things that you didn't talk about tonight. Did, yeah. So my question is, you know, of all the things that you could work on, we have all these clinical challenges. How do you as a scientist pick what you choose to spend, you and your students choose to spend your time on? Yeah, um, that's a really big question. <laughs> um, I mean, I think a lot of it comes down to the, the impact that we can have. Um, based on, you know, our, our technology, so we can't, you know, just throw away everything that we know and work on something new, perhaps. Um, I think a lot of things that motivate um, myself and my group, um, you know, a, a lot of that can come through, like, amazing collaborative interactions where, you know, like, we have some really neat technology and then there's some really interesting questions. And, you know, that's kind of how I found myself, um, you could call it meandering into new territory, but, you know, like very satisfying new areas of investigation that are really intellectually stimulating because you're always learning. I mean, clearly you're always learning from your experiments, but, you know, it's those quantum leaps where, you know, you have that eureka moments and you're like, oh, wow, this is really interesting. And we might be able to really push the envelope in terms of human health if we t attack it in this way. And it's only through this unique collaborative interaction that we're able to do so. So I, I think that those are, those are some answers. <laughs> well, that's what distinguishes partially you being a scientist in academia where you have a little more control over right. that, a lot more control over it than yep. in a company where you're working on a product often. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, all right, well, I think it's, we have to unfortunately bring the evening to a close, but uh, let's thank Danielle again for just a wonderful <laughs>